I want to look at the troubles with Elijah. Now, Elijah, he's one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, one of the most well-known Old Testament prophets. He is known greatly for prophesying that there would be no rain for three and a half years. During that time of drought, he hid by the brook Cherith, and the Lord provided for Elijah with the brook. He provided for Elijah by sending ravens to feed him, and eventually the brook would dry up, and Elijah was forced to move on. So he goes to Zarephath, and he meets a widow woman to, that sustains him. So Elijah will now have to rely on the help of another person. Instead of just the Lord, he, he's going to be forced into relying on the help of another person. So the woman, she's only got a handful of meal in the barrel. And Elijah, he's got a hard message that he has to deliver to this widow. What he's going to ask her to do is to give him a little cake first and then make one for her and her son. So she's promised a blessing. If she'll do this, she's promised a blessing in that the barrel of meal wouldn't waste and the cruise of the oil wouldn't fail until the day of the Lord, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So leaving his brook, when he left his brook, and went to Zarephath, that led him to showing the woman this miracle and resurrecting her dead son. He then eventually has the great battle between him and the false prophets on Mount Carmel, and this wouldn't have happened if he never left the brook Cherith. So, you can see how sometimes you have to move on, and if you don't move on, it doesn't open up for other things to happen. So, we're going to look at the troubles with Elijah. He had all these great things happen. However, all of these victories came with trouble. And I want to point out the troubles in Elijah's life. Now, number one, the reason that he has so much trouble is because the events of his life typifies events that's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is what most po most people refer to as the tribulation. So Elijah's life, the events in it, typifies events in the time of Jacob's trouble. The characters, the characters do. Similar to Job, Elijah is in a situation where the Lord is going to use his story to picture events in the tribulation time period. Imagine if God was going to use your life to be a picture of a horrible future event. Now, obviously, there would be trouble in your life. And no wonder Elijah had troubles. A lot of trouble. Elijah is a type of the nation of Israel. Remember, Israel comes from Jacob. So, therefore, that's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And Elijah is a type of the nation of Israel. King Ahab, the evil king that's reigning during Elijah's life, is a type of the Antichrist. And his wife, Queen Jezebel, is a type of the Antichrist woman, the great whore that you read about in Revelation 17 through 18. So there's your characters. Your characters typify characters in the time of Jacob's trouble. Elijah, picture in the nation of Israel. Ahab, the Antichrist, Queen Jezebel, the great whore. So the characters typify it. The catastrophes typify the future events of the tribulation. Through Elijah's story in 1 Kings 17 through 19, you will see many of the events picture things that are going to happen in the tribulation. Not to mention, Elijah himself comes back in that future time period as one of the two witnesses that what you read about in Revelation chapter 11. Now, I'm going to give you some con catastrophes in 1 Kings 17 through 19 that actually picture future tribulation events. I'm just going to name them off and give you the references, and you could look at them on your own time. Number one, drought. There's a drought in 1 Kings 17, 1. You see it again in Revelation 11, 6, because... Those two witnesses are able to bring that. 
Number two, Elijah is supernaturally fed as Israel is going to be supernaturally fed in the tribulation. That's 1 Kings 17, 4 through 6. That's Revelation 12, 14. Number three, Elijah is fed and helped by a Gentile woman. In 1 Kings 17, 8 through 16, and you're going to find that the Gentiles who are good to the Jews and, you know, give them food and drink, they're going to be helped by the Lord. That's Matthew 25, 34 through 40. That's the judgment of the nations where the Gentiles who help the Jews, they get to go into the kingdom for that reason. Number four, Elijah has sign gifts that confirm the words of truth. That's 1 Kings 17, 24. And in Revelation eleven six, 6, you see that he has those sign gifts once again. Number five, you got famine in 1 Kings 18, 2. And you see that in Matthew 24, 7, when Jesus Christ is describing the signs of his coming. What shall be the signs of his coming and of the end of the world? Famine's one of them. Number six, you got Jews in hiding in 1 Kings 18, 4. And you'll see that in the tribulation, Matthew 24, 16. They're going to flee. Number seven, you got grass shortage in 1 Kings 18, 5. And you got that again in Revelation 8, 7 during the tribulation. So that's just a few ways that the catastrophes during Elijah's time Picture the catastrophes and that future tribulation, time of Jacob's trouble. So Elijah had trouble because God would eventually use his story to be a help to tribulation saints. Just like Job and his story would eventually help people in the tribulation. You know that verse that said, have you heard of the patience of Job? But even today we can get help from Elijah's story. Uh, Romans 15, 4. In Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. You see, all these things that you read about in the Old Testament, that's written for your learning. That's written to get you comfort, comfort and give you hope. You know, if Elijah can do it, he's just a regular man. Me and you can do it by the help of God. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So these things are for our learning, for our admonition. So when, remember when you're going through trouble like Elijah, that God can use your story also to help somebody else. I bet you Elijah wasn't really thinking, well, this is this my story is going to be used to help millions and millions of of saints of God all the way up until the end of time. He probably wasn't thinking that. But maybe God can take your story and help somebody else. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 4, it says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves also, where, wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So, you're able to comfort others because you went through trouble and got comfort yourself. So, remember that as you go through Elijah's story. And remember his life and the characters in his life, even himself, typify things in the time of Jacob's trouble, the characters, the catastrophes. Now, number two. Number one was he had trouble in his life because his life typifies events of the time of Jacob's trouble. Number two, he trusted in the wrong information. Look at 1 Kings 19, 1 through 3. In 1 Kings 19, 1 through 3, it says in Ahab... There's your evil king that pictures Antichrist. And Ahab told Jezebel, there's your evil queen that pictures the great whore. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, 
Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, by this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. So Elijah had trouble, number one, because he trusted in the wrong information. That's when you really start messing up. You start trusting in other things outside of the Word of God and looking too much into what people say. It's really going to mess you up. He trusted in the wrong information. He started listening to the messengers of Satan. Elijah listened to the message of Jezebel and took it serious. He put more trust in her words than God's provision over him thus far. You see, you can't trust in a letter from a Jezebel because eventually you're going to be sent a messenger of Satan to buffet you, just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. He said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He was sent a messenger of Satan. You're going to be sent a messenger of Satan. It could come in the form of just a person at work bugging you to death, being a thorn in the flesh. It could come in many ways. But Elijah, his was Jezebel. And see, today, preachers are being tossed to and fro. Ephesians 4.14, being tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slot of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, by just crazy preachers tossing them to and fro. They're listening to every doctrine out of their mouth and going along with it. Or they'll get on TikTok and they'll see just crazy stuff that goes completely against the Bible, making them believe in some form of evolution making them believe in some form of reincarnation or something like that. And then they're getting up and telling people that. They're being tossed to and fro. But those are those people are messengers of Satan. Anytime that somebody gives something that contradicts the Bible, that's a messenger of Satan. Or they'll get on YouTube. They'll see false pe pe uh, prophets, false teachers on there saying, well, the rapture is going to happen this date. And then they'll go around teaching, well, the rapture is going to happen this day because this person had all this proof. Or they'll get on Facebook and they'll see a bunch of junk on there. And they've turned into Alex Jones with a King James Bible under their arm or something. They're believing messages from Jezebel as, as they begin to take conspiracy theories and false doctrines over the Word of God itself. <clears throat> now, it's good to understand current events that are going on it's good to know about the conspiracies and use those to, you know, to wake people up because a lot of the conspiracies are true but they're getting so far extreme that way to where that's all that they're doing and they're just believing everything that's a conspiracy just because most stuff could be a conspiracy just because most things have sinister things behind them. That doesn't mean every conspiracy that comes out is the right thing. And when you start believing that, that could be a messenger of Satan trying to get you away from the Bible and you begin to be tossed to and fro. So it's messengers of Satan. It's these messages of sensationalism. You see, there's a lot of sensational preachers and they it's like they're Jezebel spirit-filled because they've got the messenger message of Satan. They've got a message just like Jezebel had that's just putting fear, constant fear in people. Just like she sent that letter towards Elijah and it gave him a message of just doom and gloom that wasn't even of God. So these Jezebel spirit-filled video clips that's out there 
It's nothing more than placing unnecessary fear on the child of God so that he focuses more on fear than in the word of God itself. This is the spirit of fear. And in 2 Timothy 1, 7, what does it say? In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you're constantly just, I mean, I'm all about looking at end time stuff, looking at stuff that relates to the last time, signs that we could be nearing the tribulation. Obviously, we're going out in the rapture before the tribulation, but if we're already seeing signs of things that's going to be in the tribulation, we know we're getting even close to the rapture. I'm all for that, but when you spend your whole study time just looking into conspiracies and all that stuff, you're, you're going to get to where you're just defeated and just full of fear. And there's a lot of sensational preachers out there with all they do is go around with this Jezebel message and they're doing it to try to make themselves a name or sell books or get a big following. And it's just this type of preaching leads the people to a spiritual famine of hearing the words of God. It gets them looking forward to Donald Trump and not the sound of the last Trump. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It gets them thinking that they're dead meat if they don't stock up on canned foods for the tribulation. When they're not even going through the tribulation, you'll notice that a good portion of these pastors, it's all about all they want to do is do the conspiracy stuff. It, they're usually post-tribbers. And they're usually recommending you stock up on food because the tribulation's coming or that you're already in the tribulation. And, and if that's what your mind is on, what's your mind on? It's on things down here. Well, they should be setting their affection on things above, Colossians 3, 2, and taking no thought for the morrow, Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Obviously, it's good to be prepared, and it's, it's fun to look into the conspiracy stuff, and you should hit on it from time to time, but when your whole ministry is just putting a lot of fear in people, Tell them to stock up on canned foods and buy this survival kit that you got for sale for the tribulation. It's just, again, it begins to be just messages of sensationalism. The Jezebel message can cause you to forget about the promises of God and also the fact that everything's going to be all right. If you're saved, everything's going to be okay. Romans 8.28 no matter what happens in this life, when you when you die or when the rapture happens, everything's going to be okay. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Whatever you're going through now, just know everything's going to be all right. The rapture's going to happen. You're going to die. You're going to be with the Lord. So, Elijah had so much trouble because his life typifies events in the time of Jacob's trouble. Number two, he trusted in the wrong information. Number three, he's got, he's got the temptation of isolation. Now look back at 1 Kings 19, 3 through 4. So when Elijah saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. So he, he's got the temptation of isolation. He's got antisocial characteristics. At first, Elijah got alone and hid because God told him to back there in 1 Kings 17, 3 when he was by the, the brook Cherith. And it's good to be alone at times, but you don't want to stay alone. Elijah eventually runs off, leaves his servant, and hides under a juniper tree by himself. He left his servant 
and just gets off by himself again because of Elijah, uh, because of Jezebel's message. So Elijah's introvert personality seems to overtake him at times. And as a type of Israel in the tribulation, he is out in the wilderness, 1 Kings 19, 4, on the run from Ahab, a type of Antichrist, and Jezebel, a type of mystery Babylon. So you, you continue to just see how his life typifies the events in the tribulation. He's picturing Israel out in the wilderness, getting away from Ahab and Jezebel. And as an introvert myself, my flesh always wants to run away from people and problems and hide under a juniper tree where the shadow thereof is good, you know. Hosea 4.13, and my flesh loves darkness rather, rather than light, John 3, as John 3.19 talks about. It can be extremely hard to be around others and live up to their expectations, especially church people, especially your family at times, to live up to their expectations. So you just want to, you got that temptation isolation, you just want to get away. And the, the thorn in the flesh that you have can be an actual person that just makes you want to run and hide. It can be difficult to find a response to their complaints. It can be difficult to deal with their fault finding and their slander and their hateful comments. The greatest response to the devil and his crowd is the word of God and not giving up. That's what Jesus did in Matthew 4.4. 4. He just gave him the word of God. And, you know, at churches a lot, the pastors can bind heavy burdens that are grievous to be borne, you know, like the Pharisees are said to do in Matthew 23, 4, and that will make you just want to go and hide under a juniper tree because you can't live up to their message. They become so out of touch with reality. You know, another instance in which you might get extreme temptations of isolation, just any, any get-together, Maybe a church dinner. Uh, maybe just something the church, that the church does outside of regular service. The devil might come to you and say, you, you got no right to be here, to be in here eating with these, with these people. You don't belong. You're a waste of space. And all these comments like that, that's always, that's the messengers of Satan. Once again, all that's unbiblical and ungodly. Because you think about it, is it biblical for you to say, I've got no right to be here, you know, eating with these people or doing this with these other Christians or that you're a waste of space? That's unbiblical because if you're saved, you're in the body of Christ. As a member of the body, you're equal with them. 1 Corinthians twelve twenty one. You know, the foot can't say unto the hand, I have no need of you. And there's no waste. You're not, you can't be a waste of space in the body. Your space is needed. If you're, a, if you're just a foot or a hand, that's needed in the body. So you see, you, you get all these comments in your mind. But most likely it's the messengers of Satan. So the temptations of isolation, they're not of God. Alone time is good, just not all the time. Elijah had the temptation of isolation. He had the antisocial kind of introvert personality, and it could get the best of him. So his antisocial characteristics would get the best of him. And the effects of excessive isolation, you begin to think you're the last one left who's right with God. As Elijah thought in 1 Kings 18, 22, look what he says. 1 Kings 18, 22, then said Elijah to the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. When you're alone all the time and it's just you and God, you start thinking you're the last one left. And you see that with a lot of preachers sometimes you can tell that they have got alone too much they start thinking they're the last one right with God and they begin to just everything that they put out is exposing somebody else that's not doing the exact same thing that they do or that doesn't see things the exact same way that they see it 
he thought he was the last one left, yet the Lord says in 1 Kings 19, 18, there's, there's 7,000 men who hadn't bowed their knee to the image of Baal. See, there's all types of people left that are right with God, just as right with God as you are. You just don't know about it. But men, they see the corrupt churches, they see the fake Christians, they see the false Bibles, they see the bad doctrine, and this causes them to forsake fellowshipping entirely, and they end up out in the woods thinking that they're the last man right with God. But you're not the last one left. Believing that would just lead to depression, as it did with Elijah. Remember, there are Bible believers scattered all over the place, and that they're going through the same things that you're going through. It says in 1 Peter 5, 9, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Your brethren that are in the world are facing the same things that you're facing. And if Elijah never got out from under the tree, he couldn't have passed the mantle on to Elijah. If you don't get out from under the tree, you can't commit anything to faithful men, as Paul talks about doing in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. So Elijah, he had problems because he typifies events that's coming in the time of Jacob's trouble. Number two, he trusted in the wrong information. Number three, he's got the temptation of isolation. He got alone too much. Number four, he's troubled by depression. In 1 Kings 19.4, it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He's troubled by depression. He's overwhelmed by the ministry. He had been alone, without food. He raised a boy from the dead. He battled hundreds of prophets. And he and hadn't seen the results he was looking for. And we see these Bible heroes as being above us, but actually they're just like us. They get depressed. James 5, 17 even says that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. Sometimes I get like Elijah and I'm just, I'm just ready to die. But it's not for the reason that Paul was ready to die. You know, Paul said, I, you know, I'm in a strait betwixt two having a, a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. You know, he was wanting to die because he knew it was better to go be with the Lord. Elijah was wanting to die for other reasons. Most times when we're ready to die, we're ready to die for other reasons. You're ready to die because you're upset with your circumstances and discontent with how things are going. But depression is a real thing. Elijah had all the symptoms of depression. He was antisocial. He couldn't eat. He was self-loathing. He was suicidal. He didn't get a rope. He didn't get a sword to try to kill himself. You see, he was so in touch with God that he thought prayer could be his suicide weapon. He thought it was a sure thing that God would complete his request to die and that his prayer would be just as effective as pulling the trigger. And we have to remember that just because we don't get the results that we want, that doesn't mean we didn't give the right message. And remember that it, it's not going to return void. You know, if you're doing what you're supposed to do as a Christian, you're putting out the Word of God. <clears throat> Isaiah 55, 11 tells you it's, you're, the Word's not going to return void. So he got overwhelmed by the ministry. He got overdriven by expectations for himself. Elijah was comparing himself with others. He said, I am no better than my father's. And many times I've saw people who had the joy. They were always on the mountaintop. They had all the answers. They had everything I thought I was supposed to have. And comparing myself to them just led me to depression. This wasn't wise. Just like in, look at 2 Corinthians 10, 12. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You see, it's not wise to do that. For one thing, you're always going to be depressed because God's not going to have you doing the same thing that they're doing. And if he's not going to have you doing the same thing that they're doing, you're not going to be usually gifted to do the same things that they're doing. That just leads to you being depressed. You see all these great Baba heroes 
are preachers of the past and saints throughout the ages, and we think we have to be just like them and do the same things they did to be spiritual. But you see, not every saint, not every saint out there can read the Bible as much as Sam Gipp. Not every saint out there can expound on the Bible like Ruckman or preach it like James Lentz or somebody like that, and that's okay. You, not everybody can preach it like Danny Castle. Not everybody can can be like all these great Bible heroes that you have. And that's okay because God uses different people who are all on different levels and with different burdens. And you can convince yourself that you have to be just like those old-time greats or the Old Testament Bible heroes. And you overdrive yourself to do something that God may not even be calling you to do. So you get overdriven by the expectations for yourself, These all these unrealistic expectations. You read about somebody did this or somebody did that, and you think, well, you've got to do that too. Uh, I've overdriven myself trying to read as many chapters a day as I've heard that this great hero of church history did 100 years ago, or to study as much as a certain teacher that, you know, he gave his, his study plan that he has for the whole day, so I try to do that study plan. Or overdriving yourself to pray as long as a, a great prayer warrior that you read about in a church church history book. But you see, God saw it fit to only put 24 hours in a day. You can't put every saint's burden on yourself that they had a burden for and expect to be able to accomplish that all these things without being overdriven. You see, per, perhaps getting under the juniper tree for a while and letting God comfort you with his touch and some rest and some bread will do you some good if you are overdriven. Maybe you could look at it like that. Because in 1 Kings 19, 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8, it says, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruse of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again and the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights in Horeb, the mount of God. So he sat down under the juniper tree. God touched him. He got some rest. He got some bread. And... It helped him when he was overdriven. Maybe you should just, if you're overdriven, just stop what you're doing for a while and just get the Bible out and just read it. Not counting how many chapters. Not because you're trying to read it as much as somebody else. Just getting the comfort from the words. So Elijah, he, he had a lot of trouble. He was troubled by depression. And the next thing, he was turned off by the apathy of men. Really turned off by the apathy of men. In 1 Kings 18, 1 Kings 18, 20 through 40, you see where he defeated the prophets of Baal. And he thought, at the end of that, everybody's going to turn away from Baal and go to the Lord God because they just seen what he did but they didn't they're still apathetic to the things of God you see Elijah is a man who saw God stop the rain as it's also going to happen in the tribulation he saw God provide for him by the brook Cherith unclean birds the ravens miraculously fed him by the brook that's more typology because unclean birds are associated with the great whore who's pictured by Jezebel in Revelation 18.2. And Elijah saw God defeat the evil prophets of Baal. And he's amazed with the Lord. He's so amazed with the Lord and he's discouraged because nobody else is awestruck enough with the Lord to serve him. And that's discouraging to Elijah. 
<clears throat> I've always had a problem believing that Elijah was terrified of Jezebel. I don't believe Elijah was requesting to die and sorrowful under a juniper tree simply because he was af afraid of a woman. I think it was because he felt discouraged and defeated and deflated because nobody had the same zeal that he had. And his discouragement put a kink in his boldness. And he got that message from Jezebel and realized that the king wasn't going to have a revival and do that which was good in the sight of the Lord and that they were going to keep Baal and hadn't realized that they were forsaking the one true God. So he was discouraged by such a letter from the person that he was wanting to be right with God the most. If Ahab and Jezebel got right, it could cause everybody to get right. So he realizes the Lord is the true God and he resents the fact that nobody else is going to he, and he resents the people for not realizing it in first kings 18 36 through 37 during the battle with the false prophets he prayed to the lord that the lord would let the people know that thou art the lord god that was elijah's desire and he was discouraged by the people not throwing out Baal because they just saw the lord's power and they saw Elijah sacrifice the most precious thing in the land during the drought, the water. Back there when he was going against those prophets of Baal, he, he had them pour water on it. And they saw the fire of God lick up the wood and the stones and the dust, the sacrifice and the water as well. The people saw this with their own eyes, and they even admitted that the Lord was God in 1 Kings 18.39. But Baal was still the God of choice. They still didn't turn to God for models. They still had other gods before Jehovah God. This caused Elijah to be exceedingly jealous for the Lord, as he says in 1910 and 1914. And if you're a pastor or a teacher, you can get discouraged when people aren't interested in the Scriptures. And you can literally get jealous for the Lord and for the Bible. You can give them the practical, the doctrinal, historical, the typology, the prophecy. You can explain how Hollywood steals all their plots from the scriptures. You can explain and expose Hollywood in the entertainment industry and talk about how that stuff has the preeminent place in their heart instead of the Lord, and you still can't get them interested in the scriptures. That could be discouraging. And I believe this is the main reason Elijah went off to the juniper tree. You can get discouraged in the apathy of men until you want to call it a day. So he was turned off by the apathy of men. And the next thing, he took himself out of the battle. In 1 Kings 19, 1 through 4, he took himself out of the battle. And he went and sat down under a juniper tree. And that gives you another thought is accomplishing the goal can take away motivation. You see, in 1 Kings 18.42, Elijah put his head between his knees. In 1 Kings 19.4, he said, it is enough. And he sat down, put his head between his knees. Then he said, it is enough. And then he sat down. And there are times when people complete their goal and then they just lay down. You see, sometimes completing a goal or getting the victory can cause you to just sit down. So what you should do is go on to the next goal, and that'll keep you motivated. You, you can tell when a pastor studied for 20 years and then just laid it down because he still preaches on the same things he did 20 years ago. But the journey of the Bible is a lifelong journey. When you complete a goal, go on to another goal. The touch of God your relationship with God must be right. You need some rest. The Lord remembers you are but flesh, as Psalm 78, 39 talks about, and some bread will keep you going. The Word of God. Without those things, the journey is too great for thee. Like he said there in 1 Kings 19, 4. In 1 Kings 19, 4, he said, but he himself, or actually it's in, 
look at first kings nineteen six. it says and he looked and behold there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head and he did eat and drink and laid him down again the angel of the lord came again the second time and touched him and said arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee so you need that bread of the word of god sometimes it's good to refresh yourself and take a break but many times it is the battles that are keeping you going and the moment you accomplish a goal you might just need to get another goal it says in titus three fourteen, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses maintain the good works so accomplish accomplishing the goal can take away motivation so get another goal because there's another task waiting for you just like with Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 15 through 21, there was still work to be done. He needed to finish the course because you know what? He still has to train up Elisha. Elijah still has to train up Elisha. The job isn't over until the chariot comes, you see. Eli Elijah hadn't been caught up by a chariot of fire to the third heaven yet. It's not over until the chariot comes. It's not over for you until the rapture or death. You want to just keep going till the end. Just like Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. You see, retirement seems sweeter to a man who spent 50 years working with his hands. Ecclesiastes 5, 12. A journey full of toil, trouble, and suffering makes the rest sweeter. The more battles you get in down here the more you keep fighting the more you keep going it's just going to make when the chariot comes seem a lot sweeter if the battle gets easy or if i take myself out before the chariot comes then i'll stop focusing on the chariot coming you'll, you'll stop even thinking about the rapture when elijah saw that chariot in second kings two eleven, and he was caught up into heaven by a whirlwind i bet it was all worth it so one day when you hear come up hither at the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and Revelation 4, 1, it will all be worth it. So to close it out, like Elijah, you may be greatly used of God. Along with that will come trouble. You can use the trouble to get patience, experience, and humbleness. The Lord can use your trouble to keep you from being exalted above measure. After a victory, be ready for trouble. After a victory, don't even take off the whole armor of God because the enemy is going to shoot fiery darts. Just like it talks about in Ephesians 6, these will many times be in the form of fear-mongering messages or a thorn in the flesh, which could be a person, or some type of depression or discouragement. So just stay in the fight, finish the course. You don't have to bite off more than you can chew. Or you'll be back under the juniper tree. Just hold the shield and swing the sword. You don't have to juggle them while you're at it. Just do your best. And you can stay in the fight and not get into a deep depression like Elijah.